Elm Logistics. For all your logistic needs, call 631 631- 299-3595. That's 631-299-3595. Elm Global Logistics. Pride, performance, and partnerships. Dino Luzi Energy Drink. Yeah, it's that good. M&J Video Games and Collectibles, sport and non-sport cards, wrestling items, autographed items. We buy, sell, and trade. M&J Video Games and Collectibles, located at 1049 Queen Street, Southington, Connecticut. Call us at 1-860-479-9223 or 860-93-GAMES. M&J Video Games and Collectibles. Stay frosty with my man Rico Ross. And the last time we were with you, we were talking about Death Wish Part Three. Quick question for you, Rico, man: How was Michael? Uh, you broke out just. You broke up just at the end. What did you say? How was Michael? How Michael Winner, the producer of Death Wish Three? How was oh, he to work with? My man, Michael Winner. Uh, Michael Winner was cool, man. Uh, it, it, we had a good time working on it he um uh, actually he kind of reminds me a little bit bit of you tim he really he's got a um yeah he does he's got a great sense of humor i'll say that much about him and um he gets things done man michael winter is i think um his his really his real claim to fame is that that this man will take a script and he will get it on time and on budget and he is just very that, that's something that was very important to him to, to bring in his films on time and on budget and he managed to do them pretty much like that every time whereas um other directors uh, uh i guess the biggest uh kind of um name comes to mind is is stanley kubrick where stanley kubrick you know he was known for for not bringing his, his films in on time or on budget Yeah, I heard he um he went way over budget with Shine, the Shining movie with Stephen King. Yeah, uh, I, I got cast in uh, Full Metal Jacket with with Stanley Kubrick, and um, I had no idea. I had no idea that you're in Full Metal Jacket, man. I got to go back and rewatch that film. No, I'm not in it. I got cast in it, but when I got cast in it, um, I had already met for Aliens, and okay, and then I and then I met him afterwards. Uh, for Full Metal Jacket, because when I when I went in to meet James Cameron for Aliens, uh, we got along really well. He he liked me, but he also um, he read me for the male lead, which was Hicks at the time. And I um, I had a lot of lot of um, film opportunities coming to me at that time, and I 
And I told him, I says, uh, you know, look, this is early in my career. I, I really am only interested in the, in the film if you're going to cast me for one of the leads. And he says, well, you know, James Cameron said, this is very early day, days uh, in the casting process. He says, I'm reading you for, for, for Hicks because that's the character that has the most uh, dialogue. And so mm -hmm. I'm reading a lot of the actors for Hicks because he has the dialogue. But, and, I, and I can see how you are as an actor. But he says, I haven't seen anybody else, so it's, it's hard for me to offer you that role right now. He says, but um, I will ask you this, before you accept anything else, will you at least come back and see me? And I said, I would. Then I met with, with Stanley Kubrick for Full Metal Jacket, and Kubrick said that, um, <laughs> uh, well, I, I, I take that back. I did not meet with Stanley himself. What I met with was his assistant. And Stanley Kubrick had this mm -hmm. um, assistant that, um, that he always worked with. And this guy had one arm and it was, and I, I met at, at, at his house, but I didn't actually meet him. And I, I go in there and I meet him and meet, meet his uh, assistant and we talk and I never really meet Stanley. And that was mm -hmm. very, very strange and very odd for me. So uh, I go back home and I'm thinking, well, you know, he obviously um, is gonna get back with me and let me know. And I, I get a call from him, uh, from, it, from my agent saying that, yeah, they want to offer you eight weeks on Full Metal Jacket to play Lieutenant Cleveland. The problem is, is that I never got a script. I only mm. got the sides. And so I didn't really know exactly how much the character was involved in the, in the project or not. Um, so uh, I uh, wanted to work with Stanley Kubrick because at, at, at that time, James Cameron wasn't the James Cameron we know now. He had mm -hmm. only done, I think maybe uh, Terminator was the biggest movie he had made. And I think he had done some, two other small movies, smaller movies. So Stanley Kubrick was the actor's director because one of the things that, that was kind of like it in the, um, in, in the zeitgeist was that Stanley Kubrick loved to have actors come in and improv and during the process of that improv, you would then, he would then finish the script. So I got back in contact with James and I says, listen, uh, I, I want to um, tell you that I, I got offered eight weeks for, for, for Full Metal Jacket. And James asked me to come in and talk to him. So I came in and talked to him. Being a man of my word, I said I would see him before I accepted anything else. So I didn't accept the uh, role at that time for, for uh, Stanley Kubrick, but I... I went in and I talked to James and I said, listen, um, I really would like to do the role uh, with Kubrick, but I said, I like this, this project as well. And I told you I, was, I wanted to come back and see you before I accepted anything. And I, as a man of my word, that's what I'm doing. And Jim said, um, listen, I can't, I still, it's still early in the, in the filming process. I cannot offer you that lead role of Hicks, but I can rewrite the script put three characters together and create one character for you. And he says, and I'm, I'm willing to offer you that right now. And he says, I tell you what I would also do. He says, I am willing to let you come back a week late because apparently the eight week period that Stanley Kubrick wanted me for only overlapped one week with, with aliens. And so he said, I'm willing to let you come back a week late. And so you can do both films, but you have to make sure that Stanley Kubrick is gonna release you after eight weeks. So I went like, great, this is excellent. I'm going to get both these babies. And I get in contact with my, my, my people and my team. And I said, listen, I can do both films. Just make sure that we get a release after eight weeks. And apparently um, Stanley Kubrick would not release me after eight weeks. He said he wouldn't do that. So then I asked him, I said, well, listen, if he's not going to release me, can he at least pay me my fee because Stanley Kubrick was pay, was offering only scale. Mm -hmm. And uh, Stanley Kubrick said no to that as well. I says, well, listen, um, ask him if he can send me the finished script so I can at least see what I'm doing. And he said no to that as, as well because he said what we were going, what his plan was, was for us to go inside of um, like a workshop, workshop the script. We were going to improv, we we're going to work it and whatever, actors shine that's what's gonna that was gonna be in the script and he was gonna then write finish the script at that time and I kind of understand it now but I really didn't understand it at that point but 
Full Metal Jacket took about a year to make. Mm -hmm. And that's a long time for a film. And that's a long time to be on the contract for one film, especially when you're only getting paid scale. And uh, I was willing to work for scale for, for Stanley Kubrick. I mean, I would have worked for free for Stanley Kubrick at that time because he was just, I wanted to work with him that bad. But at the same time, I had this other offer. So, so James told me, Cameron says, listen, I will rewrite the script, let you read the script. I will also um, let you choose the, the character that you want to play other than these, th this character. And he says, and I will pay you more, your, your fee. And so with that, I had to make a decision. And I probably am one of the few actors that have turned Stanley Kubrick down and I had to pass on Stanley Kubrick and go, go with uh, Aliens. So looking back on it now, presently, do you feel like you made the right choice? <laughs> um, I do feel like I made the right choice, but I got to say, I, um, maybe it's, it's that thing, you know, the thing that you, that you lose is the thing that you want the most. When, when Full Metal Jacket came out, I so wanted to be a part of that. Mm -hmm. But I also remember when we were filming, we were, we were all filming in London. Uh, we were filming, a, a, there, there were a number of films being filmed at the same time. And the Americans that lived and worked in London at that time was a very small group. And so we would, we got to know each other. We knew we were in town and we would often meet up at pubs or something like that after shoots or on the weekend. And I remember the guys on Full Metal Jacket, they were freaking miserable during that shoot mm -hmm. they uh, a lot of them were waiting around for very long times and not being used and and, and we're used to wait as, as actors you know they, they call you in and they have you rush rush <laughs> rush to wait 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 that's the saying and so we're used to that but some actors and, and full metal jacket were coming getting called early at seven o'clock in the morning getting made up getting wardrobe and then waiting all day and never being used and mm -hmm. that could drive you freaking crazy. I mean, you're getting paid for it, so you you know you really can't complain. But at the same time, you're like an athlete at the starting gate, and they're not letting you run. And, and, right. And you you're can right. do that for a while, but it, it, it <laughs> will drive you crazy if you're doing it day after day after day. And for some of the actors, week after week. Uh, right. there, were one, there was one actor on Full Metal Jacket where this guy was on the film for months and was not used i don't know if you know this story tim mm -hmm. uh, I, I can't think of the actor's name but we used to kick it uh we used to hang out together he was he was kind of a he was kind of a, a firecracker but mm -hmm. he was the guy that was um supposed to be the sergeant in full metal jacket but what happened was they brought in a real sergeant in mm -hmm. full metal jacket to get the guys in shape to get them used to doing cadence, to get them used to being in formation, to teach them all of the things that a real soldier should know. Mm -hmm. But this guy that they brought in, who was a real soldier and wasn't an actor, Stanley Cooper liked him so much that he decided he was going to give him the role. And so after months of waiting for this to, to do his thing, the guy that was supposed to play the role, the actor that was supposed to play the role, was told that, listen, you're not going to play the role. As a matter of fact, we're gonna pay you off and give you a ticket back to, to LA. And that's what happened. And then later on, <laughs> the same <laughs> actor got a call from, from, um, from Stanley Kubrick saying, listen, I got this one scene of a uh, soldier hanging out of a uh, helicopter and he's shooting down at, at, at the uh, enemy. And if you, when you watch the movie, that one scene where you see this crazy guy hanging out of the movie and he's, he's got a machine gun, he's just going, yeah, take that and that and that. He's like, rah, 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 rah. That's the guy that was supposed to be playing the sergeant. So uh, there, was a, there was another black guy on, um, on Full Metal Jacket who, play, who, who, who was playing a lead. And he was a friend of mine from back here in, in Hollywood. Uh, I think his name was Adrian. I can't think of his, I can't okay. think of him right now. But he told me a story later on. He said um, that he had been extending his contract for three times. And he said uh, he, he was working for scale as well. Mm -hmm. And he said, by the third time, he says, I asked him, I said, listen, I, I can't keep working for scale. He said, I'm happy to, ex I'm, I'm a team player. I'm happy to extend the contract again, but can you at least pay me my fee? Mm -hmm. And Stanley Kubrick told him no. And mm -hmm. 
did not extend him, but what he did do was he shot all of his scenes and killed them off right away. And in his in this guy's dying scene, he had to, they were trying to replicate the, uh, a poster, a famous poster at the time uh, of a Vietnam guy getting shot. Uh, and I think the caption was why, and it was a kind of anti-war thing. And basically you saw this guy running through like a swamp and he gets shot. And at the instant he gets shot, his hands go up and he falls in, into the swamp. Mm -hmm. And this guy had to replicate that in the film. And he said that Stanley Kubrick had him do it over and over and over again. And he felt like it was Stanley Kubrick saying, okay, you're not gonna, gonna play my game. I'm gonna, I'm gonna take you out, out of the film, but I'm gonna take you out this way. And he, and it, it was just kind of like the, the mood of the film and the mood of a lot of the actors that were working on that film is it was, it was not a, a pleasant film to work on. So with that in mind, I'm, I'm pretty happy that I did Aliens instead of Full Metal Jacket. But I, every time I, I, I would see Full Metal Jacket or someone would mention it, it would kind of sting a little bit because it, it was a great movie, man. It was a great movie and it was some good actors. And I, I think, um, I think I would have had a, an opportunity to show what I could do. But, you know, in Aliens, Aliens was a, a very different experience because when I did Aliens, we shot it for three months. I think I had a three month contract, but a lot of the times I, would, I wasn't being used. And mm -hmm. I had another movie that I was doing, uh, Mission Impossible at the same time. Aliens was shooting in London and Mission Impossible was shooting in Prague. And so I told James I wanted to do his film, but I said I did have a contract already on, with the film. And, it, and, and, and my part in, in um, Mission Impossible, it only took a couple of weeks to do it. Unfortunately, the weeks were not all at once. So James says, I'll let you do this film and, I, and I'll schedule around your Mission Impossible shoot. And so I was able to shoot Aliens, fly to Prague, shoot Prague, fly back to London, shoot aliens and fly back to Prague and finish Prague. So it was a, it was a different kind of experience. And James was very accommodating. So I, that made it a lot easier for me to, to choose to do aliens. And, and in the end, you know, aliens is, is a classic, you know, full, full metal jacket to me is still kind of a classic. I think platoon came out afterwards and platoon was very similar and kind of took some of the steam away from full metal jacket. But I, I, I thought that that full metal jacket was a really, really good movie as well. So I actually knew about the guy's name was R. Lee Emery. He was yes. a real drill instructor. He came in and got the part in Full Metal Jacket. And one of my clients actually played in Full Metal Jacket as the character Dunlon. His name was Gary Landed Mills. But um, Aliens, man, what Aliens did, brother, was Aliens endeared you to the fans. So you have a lifelong place at Comp worldwide comic conventions because of aliens very that's true. what aliens did for you very true <laughs> very very I think true. You made the right <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, you're right about that and 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 one of the things that I, I i i don't take for granted either is that um aliens fans also has made um the cast members a family because we get together every mm -hmm. couple of months and uh, we've a lot of films, what you do is you, you work on the film and there's a lot of time, downtime. So during that downtime, you actually get to know the actors that you're working with. And sometimes you, you know, you meet some people and they, you think these guys, this, this person could be a, a lifelong friend, but mm -hmm. inevitably what happens, the film finishes, you move on to another film and you lose contact with that person and mm -hmm. you really enjoyed their company. Alien fans, because of, of these, these comic cons have allowed us to constantly reunite and i really i don't know if they appreciate how much we appreciate that fact uh because uh i i became really good friends i, I really enjoyed um the cast that we were working with uh i think uh we've told the story a lot of times that that on aliens they had a similar thing happen where they brought in a, a real sergeant two weeks before mm -hmm. the shoot and they just worked mm -hmm. us and got us in shape and that also got us to know each other. And, mm -hmm. um, and once you know each other like that, you know, you do feel like, okay, I know this person and I want to, I want to keep this kind of relationship going. And we moved on to other projects, but the fans keep bringing us back. And, and I really, uh, I really thank them for that. 
So what was the audition process like for you on Aliens? I mean, you already kind of explained how why you chose Aliens over top of Full Metal Jacket, but what was the actual audition process like for that film? Well, James called people in like, like they normally do. What happens is your agent gets a, gets a breakdown and finds out that there's a character that you would be good. They submit you and then you come in and meet with the director or the mm -hmm. casting director. So I met with James the first time and I, uh, I had a, like I said, you knew I, I, I said I was working on, a, I had a contract for Mission Impossible. And so I, um, I got to tell you some, a story about Mission Impossible and Tom Cruise and me as well. But, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> but I, I, I had that contract in, uh, in my pocket already. So I was trying to see how I can work this thing out with aliens in it, and it ended up working out pretty good. But James called me in, he, um, he, 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 he met with me and he wasn't hiding his cards. He was very upfront. He says, I really like you. I'd love you to be a part of the project. And, mm -hmm. um, and you know, I know you got some other things going. I can't offer you the role that you're asking for right now, but I will, would like you to be a part of the project. And I said, I would love to be a part of the project. You know, when you read a, a script, Tim, and you, you know this too, man, you, mm -hmm. you, you read a script and some scripts, when you read them, the words just like drop off the page, man. They're just like, bam, you know, this is going to be something special. And then there are films where you read it and you don't think much of it. You think, okay, this is just a job. But when I read this script, I thought it was going to be something special. But I had done a, a movie prior to Aliens called, um, uh, with, with Vanessa Redgrave's daughter, Jolie Richardson, and, and myself played the lead. Spies Like that. Us? No, it wasn't that. Uh, it'll come to me. Anyway, okay. so we, so I'm I'm doing this movie. We did we're working on this movie, and um, Jolie Richardson had had this was her first uh, lead role. Uh, it was my first romantic lead role. It, it was very different because you got to keep in mind this was in the '80s, and mm -hmm. we were playing an interracial couple on film, so that was very this was very different. And mm -hmm. uh, we had some other really good actors in in the film, and. Um, what happened was we shot the whole film. There was a scene in the film where there was a mass shooting. Well, well the bad guys came into a, a club and they were looking for us and they couldn't see us because there were so many people. So kind of dark comedy, they ended up just shooting everybody in the club and then walking around lifting people's head going, no, that's not them. No, that's not her. That's not him. And it was kind of some dark comedy in the course of the movie. Uh, we go on to make the movie, to finish the movie, and they're setting us up for to go on tour to, to promote the movie. And then I get a call before I'm supposed to get on a flight to go to Paris, and they say they're going to hold the movie. And I ask, well, what's, what's going on? And they said, well, there, is, um, there was the, uh, a, a massacre, a shooting, a mass shooting in Hungerford, England. And mm. this is a very rare thing. Uh, in, in England, very rare. Uh, mm -hmm. We have them every day here, but in England, that was something that never happened. And this, this is the biggest mass shooting ever in the country. And it had happened just before we were about to release the film. So they said, we're going to put the film on hold and see if we can hold it and maybe release it a few months down the road, which they did. Uh, but even when they released the film, the film died because the next morning, mm -hmm. all the talking heads were only talking about that scene where the, there was a mass shooting in there and comparing it to the real life thing. So that mm -hmm. film I thought was gonna change my life. And I just remember reading it and thinking that this is, this is a game changer. And because it didn't, whenever I would read a film after that, I would not allow myself to get too excited about it because I just was afraid that it, was gonna, it could possibly let me down. So I just thought, listen, Rico, don't get emotional about this. This is a business. Get, go in there, do your thing. And uh, after you, as I said before, as I often say, after, after it's over, it's over. What happens, happens. That's out of your control. Just go in there and do your thing. So when I read Aliens, I read the script and I had never even seen the first Alien film. So I thought, do I even want to see the Alien film? Because as an artist, my fear in the back of my head, I'm thinking, well, if I see this other film and there are actors in it, will that influence me and, and make me try and almost copy some of the things that they're doing as opposed to being original and just coming to this thing fresh. Mm -hmm. But I thought I need to know the quality 
the flavor of this film. So I, I watched that movie. I, I put in a video at the time. And I remember watching the movie by myself one night, man, and it was the scariest thing. But it helped me because it wasn't, even though it was about the same subject matter and had, had Sigourney in it, it was more of a suspense movie. And our movie was more of an action movie. So mm -hmm. I didn't feel like it, 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 it really spoiled anything that I could bring to the film, but it did give me some heads up about the quality, the, 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 the tone of the film um, and, and what it was about. But yeah, um, I, I, um, I read the script and, and when James offered me the part and we finally worked it out, I was really happy that, you know, that I was able to do that project. Uh, even though at that time I had no idea I was working on a future classic. So prior to Aliens, you actually worked with one of my favorite singers of all time, my man, on a video called Saving All My Love For You, Whitney Houston. What was that oh. like, man, working with Whitney? <laughs> Whitney and I, man, we had a great time on that project. We had mm -hmm. such a, a good time. And, and at that time, Whitney had – she the, that, that uh, video became her first number one hit, mm -hmm. Saving All My Love For You. Mm -hmm. And that really just shot her up into uh, the stratosphere as far as, an, as a singer, because she was gorgeous as hell. Uh, she was able to act, to, to act, and I had to give her some pointers on when we're shooting the film because she was so overacting it when we first started. And, and she could sing like an angel, man. That voice of hers was crazy. Uh, when I first got, the, got, the, got called in to do it, they said, listen, we wanna uh, love you to come and do this project with me. I get on set. And the director tells me, he goes, you know, we had already cast this role, but the uh, the other guy was too good looking. And I was <laughs> like, oh, that's a backhand compliment. He goes, yeah, but the other thing was, he was good looking, but he couldn't act. And <laughs> we just thought, we got to get a, a, a real actor in here. And that's why I showed up. And then we show up and we're doing, the, we're working on it, on, a, on this video. And um, it's going great. The song is beautiful. She's beautiful. The the whole story was great. And at that time, you know, the, this was early, early days in, in, in video when they were just, um, a lot of them didn't have the quality of storytelling like this particular video did for the song. Uh, mm -hmm. Michael Jackson kind of changed the, the game as well. But this was one of the, the, the first videos where the storyline was a great storyline and they shot it like a movie. And it, this, was, this was groundbreaking. And um, I remember when we were shooting the film, we had this one scene it, it, for those who, who don't know the uh, story behind it, basically in the film, I play this character who is her producer. I'm producing this movie, this song for her. And mm -hmm. we're working together. We're working long hours. And during the course of working together as a producer, her and I start falling for each other. The problem is I'm married. And so we start falling for each other. But as the project ends and we produce the, the record, when the record's gone, I go back to my wife and so she's saving her love for me that's that's the story of, of the film and we shot it in london it was beautifully shot there was this one scene where i'm behind i'm in, i'm in the booth uh producing her and she's on the other side of the glass and she's singing and she's just mouthing the words and we, we could hear the recording of her voice and she's singing like you know that song her voice is amazing anyway but she's just mouthing it and as she's mouthing it, you can see there's no real magic there. Mm -hmm. And we're shooting take after take, and the director is not happy. And then he says, listen, Whitney, do you mind if we, um, if, can you actually sing it this time? And she says, of course. And she sings it. And I tell you, Tim, it is at that point when I thought, I think she might have been 21 at the time. I, that's, I, at that point, I thought, this girl has got it. Whatever mm -hmm. that it is, she's got it. Because the moment she starts singing and she starts emoting into this song, I knew that she had three things that most artists don't have. She, she, she was gorgeous as hell. She had a voice that was amazing. And when she actually sang it, she got into it like an actor gets into a role. She became that character. And I just thought, well, those three things, there's no stopping this woman right now. And, uh, and I told her that. And we had a great time. As a matter of fact, we, she, we exchanged numbers 
Uh, I was living in London at the time. She was living in New York. So we didn't get a chance to hang out much after that, but um, we had planned to. And then, um, you know, she <laughs> hooked up with uh, Bobby Brown and the rest is history. Yeah, I don't know if you knew this or not, but I'm getting ready to produce a film called The King's Bodyguard about my client, Dave Hebler, who was Elvis's bodyguard. Elvis oh, really? had a female group called the uh, um, Sweet Inspirations. And one of the Sweet Inspirations was Sissy Houston, who was Whitney Houston's mother. Right. And Whitney Houston was actually raised around Elvis Presley. Wow, I did not know that. Mm hmm Well, I'll tell you a bit of trivia, too. <laughs> what did you say? A lot of a lot of his charisma, his personality, his stage aura kind of rubbed off on her. I think. Ah, exactly, exactly. I'll tell you a, a, an interesting anecdote as well. Uh, years afterwards, maybe uh, this is in, I think it was 2017. 2017, I get a call and they said, uh, "Listen, someone wants to see you to play um, the role of uh, Whitney Houston's uncle." slash bodyguard wow and i was like really and I thought, this is interesting and so uh, i meet with them and uh and we decide uh yeah it, it was for a, a movie for television called um bobby christina okay and bobby christina is whitney's daughter mm -hmm. bobby bobby brown and whitney's daughter mm -hmm. and it was basically her life story it was kind of seen from her her point of view and i was playing the um the uh the bodyguard and of course it goes through the whole thing of when her mother passes away and everything and, and what the bodyguard did and how he tried to handle the situation uh during this crisis and even while we're making the movie uh i i had the good fortune of of, of uh asking can i actually speak with this guy i want to i want to kind of find out how he talks i want to get his flavor when you're playing somebody that's a real person and they're still alive you know, I, I, it really does help the actor if you can kind of meet with that person. So he wasn't, uh, we shot it in Atlanta and he, he, he wasn't in Atlanta, but he agreed to get on the phone and talk to me and, and kind of like give me the ins and outs about his job and what he did and, and how he felt. And just listening to his voice and his cadence and whatnot, I kind of felt like I had a better grip on the character. Uh, and it was a great opportunity for me to learn more about it. But I just thought it was, it was interesting that I, played uh her whitney's lover and then like, later on i play her uncle in uh in, in her daughter's film and then uh unfortunately her daughter ends up passing away shortly afterwards uh mm -hmm. the same way her mother did um but it was a it was it was a good it was a great project and me and the producers got along well and the producer actually asked me if i would be willing to um to resurrect this this character because she had an idea of shooting another film from the bodyguard's point of view because the bodyguard has a lot wow. of information that no one knows about and he's still alive and she wanted to shoot and she said i love your portrayal of him and it's inspired me to uh to to possibly write a film just from his point of view and so we're we, you know i i said i'd love to, to do that because after speaking to the guy i knew that he had he had secrets that nobody else knew, but that never materialized. And I'm wondering if the reason why it never materialized is because he had secrets that he did not want to get out. And when someone's passed away, you know, you probably want to respect them a little bit more. So I think that was part of the reason why it never, it never got out. Or it could be because some of those same ideas were incorporated into the bodyguard with Whitney Houston and Kevin Costner. That might be another idea altogether. There, there. I hadn't thought about that. Yep, I hadn't thought about that. Yeah, that's a that's a good possibility. So we are actually at the end of episode two with Stay Frosty with my man Rico Ross, and we are coming back to you in a minute. We're going to send you another link to your email, Rico, with episode three, ladies and gentlemen. We'll see you in one moment. All right, and as usual, stay frosty, brother. Yes. <laughs> <laughs>